audio. Keep talking. There you go. Hi, I'm Michael Fitzgerald, and I'm a, a journalist who uh, was asked to moderate this panel because I wrote a piece on, on uh, where the loft is now uh, that got published last year in CSO magazine and, and just won an award. You guys Yay! are award winners or something. So, <laughs> thank you. My job is mostly to stay out of your way and, and also to uh, make sure that uh, they don't get boring. Um, so, uh, I, I have a, lot, a big task ahead of me. Uh, please throw fruit at them when they do start to fall off track. Um, but basically what we're going to do here is we're going we're to talk for an hour about issues that uh, you know, have emerged from, from the days that the law is being formed uh, in the security field, and we'll talk a bit about where they are. And we're going to have them start by, uh, each of them is going to introduce himself. They are going to uh, talk about you know, what their handle was, whether they're still using the handle now, uh, why they picked the handle, whether they're still using it now, uh, and what they're doing today. They have two minutes to introduce themselves. Oy. They can all take a drink if they succeed in, in keeping it under two minutes, except Mudge, who can only drink if he does not exceed two minutes. <laughs> okay, so take it away, guys. So, I guess I'll start at the end. Uh, Chris Weishopel, uh also known as Wald Pond, not formally known as, because uh, you know occasionally people will still refer to me that, and you know there's nothing, nothing shady that happened that I'm trying to hide from. Um, the uh, the, the, uh, the name originally came because um, I was forced to pick a name to enter a BBS in Boston called The Works. And they said, we don't allow anyone to use their real name. And I said, ooh, this is going to be interesting. So, uh, but then I said, I have to pick one. And I really wanted to log in. I, and so I didn't spend a lot of time doing it. I just uh, had, a, had a map on my wall. And I pointed at the map. And I pointed to Weld Pond, which is in... Uh, I think it's in Braintree, Massachusetts. I've never actually been there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was living in Somerville at the time. And so, uh, you know, it's completely goofy and random, and uh, it just seemed to work, so I stuck with it. And oh, so what am I doing now? Um, uh, I was one of the ones who actually stayed the whole, uh, the whole purgatory of at stake, I guess. Good times and bad times. Um, lasted the whole time from when the loft was there until the company got sold to Symantec. Um, and then I was at Symantec for another year. And now um, I'm working with uh, Christian Ryu down the end. And we uh, are the co-founders of Vericode. Thanks. You may take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, John Tan. Uh, I picked that na name because of uh, the uh, um, safe company that uh, protects the crown jewels for the uh, royalty in London there. The uh, John Tan Safe Company. So that's just a physical security reference. And for the same reason everybody else, you know, has has done it in the past, is uh, just be anonymous online for one thing to protect uh, your identity in the same way that it just makes common sense. Um, you tell your children to do the same thing, right? So, um, and now I'm in the finance industry again. I spent 10 years before Loft in finance, and uh, after at stake, I'm back in in the finance industry once again. So. You may also take a drink. <laughs> I should have brought alcohol. Yeah. I'll drink one. Cheers. Okay. I'm timing. Yeah. Okay. I thought we were going to have five minutes. I thought we were supposed to go through with what we've done the past ten years. Um, <laughs> all right. Tell me when I can start. Because <laughs> my, my wife my wife was uh, nice enough to. So one of the things is I got married. I'm Mudge. Uh, and in the last ten years, let's see. I'm currently. How about you pick the name? Huh? I'll get to that at the end there. Uh -huh. If you're interrupting, I get some extra seconds then. <laughs> um, I'm currently the technical director of national intelligence research and applications for BBN, a little company that invented the internet, first silent running uh, torpedoes, lots of stuff like that. I was made a plank owner of one of the current destroyers, along with Madeleine Albright and Richard Clark. Um, I've been giving a lot of talks at universities associated with CyberCore. CyberCore is the President's Scholarship for Service. Uh, this is kind of like a cyber ROTC. Uh, you get uh, your college uh, paid for, and then you have to go do two years or four years working for a national lab, working for the CIA, the NSA, or one of those places. Um, I provide uh, reports and input to the Intelligence Science Board and the Director of National Intelligence. I was visiting scientists for two, three years at Carnegie Mellon. 
Um, a couple of IEEE awards. To, oh, I got a, a congratulatory letter from uh, the CIA for contributing to their uh, mission, criti critical mission, which they didn't say what that was. Uh, <laughs> I briefed the uh, Democratic Policy Committee, Senator Edwards. I'm currently providing input to one of the presidential candidates that's running right now on critical infrastructure. And da, da, da. I, I was the person who testified against Vonage and shut them down for Verizon as an expert witness. So that's really working for the devil. Uh, got married. All that fun stuff. Fruit anytime now. Yep. So the name there, I, I give people who say, "Where did Mudge come from?" Three uh, choices for the answer. One is the short one, which is an entire lie. The second one is uh, kind of half truth, and the third's long and boring. And the actual story. Almost everybody goes for the first one, and I say it's my middle name. They say how nice, and they walk away happy. <laughs> so what's the real story? In, 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 I did that. In, in 15 seconds. Uh, I didn't like somebody whose last name was Mudge, and I figured if I was going to get busted, they'd go to his house first. <laughs> <laughs> you may take a drink. Thank you. Space Rogue. Hi. <clears throat> I'm Space Rogue. I'm probably, I think I'm the only one left who still uses their handle uh, exclusively, at least at hacker cons and stuff. Uh, I do that because, not because of uh, trying to hide anything or um, anything bad that happened. But it's, it's more of a perception thing for me. I can't really put Space Road down on my resume <laughs> and expect people to sort of take me seriously or not try to do some Google searches. And despite the, the perception of, of the word hacker and whatnot in this room, it's still very different out in the real world. And so when I'm trying to apply for a position as an IT manager and people see weird things on the resume or they do a Google search on my real name, I prefer they didn't link the two together. In some cases, it's... It would be a benefit, but I think in most cases it would actually still be a detriment, unfortunately. So while I still need to remain employed and pay my mortgage, uh, the handle and the real name stay separate. So right now I'm currently working as an IT manager for a small marketing company in Somerville. Um, it's interesting to me because I basically I'm in charge of everything in the company, from the computers to the security system to the telephones. So um, it's good. It's good work. I'll make two minutes. You may take a drink. <coughs> I need it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Paul Nash. I used to go by the uh, handle of silicosis. Um, early on in the upstate days, it was uh, interesting going into clients. Um, I think in the beginning we started off, some of us using handles or some combination of the both. But uh, early on, it was one of those things where we were doing some really, really cool research and the landscape and environment had really changed. It was no longer... Um, as big of a deal coming out with advisors or notifying companies or vendors of security issues and whatnot. So, uh, and some of the research we were doing was really cool. So I just wanted to associate my real name so that uh, looking back, I can put it on my resume. Um, I can go forward, I'll have white papers and whatnot I could uh, reference and look back. So what am I doing today? I am actually still at Symantec. I am the only law person still at Symantec. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, why are you still there? Um, everyone has left. You know, the thing is, it's actually a really cool environment. Uh, Symantec obviously is a multi-billion dollar organization, and that gives us great aperture into larger organizations and whatnot. So just being able to advise CSOs for uh, Fortune 50, Fortune 10, Fortune 100 companies, I mean, we're all over the board. And so I think Symantec really gives us the opportunity to go in there and actually start, solve hard problems. It's, uh, the loft was, um, it was a lot of fun. It was very interesting. But we were very uh, tightly focused on technology and whatnot. And security is a hard thing to solve, especially when you have 250,000 employees or multi, uh, tens of thousands of systems and whatnot. So I think that uh, it's just an interesting problem. And I like to solve problems. So. And, and so why silicosis? Oh, that, yeah, <laughs> silicosis. It's a black lung. It's a coal miner's disease, which I found out <laughs> after choosing the handle. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, yeah, but the origination, back in, uh, when I was in fourth grade, I read a short story that had uh, silicosis as one of the characters in there. It was just a, it was a really cool sounding name, and so it just stuck with me over time. So that when I was getting into the scene doing research and whatnot, it just uh, I gravitated back towards that. One of the few law members who never smoked, also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I forgot, Chris, what, what, or Space Rogue, why Space Rogue? Um, there's actually, there's a game that's called Space Rogue that I didn't know about when I picked the handle. Uh, it, it just came out from Free Word Association when I first, I think it was the works board that I first signed into that required a handle. And uh, I was sitting there at the prompt, like, what the hell is my name going to be? And I just sat there for five minutes and did basically Free Word Association, and that's what I came up with. 
and then I found out there's some stupid cheesy game called Space Rider. <laughs> Was, wasn't it also a John Bruner uh, Shockwave no, Rider? No, no, no. Shockwave Rider is my other handle, uh, Sandy Halflinger. Oh, right, right, right. the right. main character in Shockwave Rider by John Bruner, which if Great you've book. never read, I highly recommend. Uh, he talked about the worldwide internet like, you know, 20 years ago. So. Weren't you also known as a Space Rouge occasionally? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that comes out because of Space Ronix, which is where Space Rouge comes from. Uh, okay. That's a whole other topic. <laughs> another topic. So we'll save that for later. You can take another drink. I can take next one. Yeah. Dill. All right, Dill, I go by, I've gone by Dill, Dill Dog, a bunch of other Dill Dog uh, uns, 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 unsavory <laughs> names. Um, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really use a handle anymore. I've mostly been in a cave writing code for the last few years. Uh, I did uh, a lot of work uh, over the course of years uh, at AtStake and now at Veracode on uh, decompilation technologies, making sort of the theoretically possible uh, decompilation process actually tractable for um, you know analyzing large binaries. Um, the uh, the name Dildog. <laughs> I actually want, I, pick, I wanted to pick something that sounded, um, dirty. well, not unoffensive. I guess that's not the word I was looking for. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'd seen a lot of handles like names like Evil Super Killer or Lord Digital or some other thing that was just too, like, maybe pretentious. I wanted to have something that was approachable. So I picked the name without quite realizing that it needed a, the, the hyphen in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like it's like the experts exchange. You know, if you take the hyphen on yeah. text. Anyway, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, the Dildog name is actually the uh, uh, the name of the Dogbert character from the Dilbert comic strip before it was syndicated. Uh, Scott Adams had named all the characters Dilbert, Dill Dog, Dill Cat, Dill, etc., and uh, the editors wouldn't let him print it. They censored it and made him change the name because they had the substring dildo in it. I actually didn't notice that part of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I always capitalized the two Ds, so it, 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 was, it wasn't obvious to me until I got laughed out of Pound Hack on IRC when I first came in there. Um, but uh, yeah, well, that's basically it. And does anybody quickly want to talk about uh, uh, Kingpin and, and Brian Oblivion and whether they're still in the business? Well, uh, King, Kingpin um, now has uh, Grand Idea Studios, and he does a lot of hardware hacking. He designed the uh, the uh, the badges for uh, DEF CON last year, LED, and uh, I think they had wireless capability. Uh, last two years, yeah, I think. Last two years. So uh, he's uh, he's on the board of advisors for uh, Make Magazine, um, and uh, now as. As Mudge was saying, he, he's uh, working on a documentary, much like the the Monster Garage type uh, shows, where uh, people are basically doing hardware hacking. It's a do-it-yourself show, isn't it? I mean, like a yeah. regular thing on uh, Discovery Channel or something. Uh, Discovery, I think he's going to air in September. I think he told me. Okay. So, so and uh, Brian, um, as far as I know, is working um, on wireless systems, um, secure military wireless systems. I just I just saw him uh, okay. four days ago. Uh, he was actually up in uh, Boston for one day. He had to come into BBN. Uh, we used some of the boards that they were doing. So, yeah. he's yep out there doing his hardware and wireless stuff. All right. So let's get into the meat of this. What's this uh, taking down the internet in 30 minutes comment? Where did it come from? Did you ever really try it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it came from me, unfortunately, um, and it was uh, something that the media uh, keyed in on during our Senate testimony in 1998. And what we were talking about was uh, BGP, well, were BGP attacks against the national access points or metropolitan area ethers, which are the major uh, kind of muxes for uh, long haul uh, intercarrier exchange of information. Uh, it was entirely possible to do. Uh, actually, uh, the Loft uh, web server sat uh, on a cable being pulled out of May East, so anybody could actually get there, and nobody had BGP filters in place at the time. Uh, even with the current best practices of BGP, um, they don't have the protective mechanisms in place for it. The, uh, it. It actually did happen a few times as well, just accidentally, where people will basically black hold the entire internet um, uh, by publishing bogus routes accidentally. And anything you can do accidentally, just through you know sloppy work, you can intentionally do. Uh, and this will keep it down. It went down for like a couple hours here or there. 
Yeah. Case uh, in point, YouTube and Pakistan. Oh, you, yeah, very similar one just happened with YouTube and Pakistan. You can take countries off pretty easily. Uh, what's happened, what's happened, yeah, well, Estonia's <laughs> a bit different. Uh, what, what, what's happened since then is that we've gone to a lot of private peering agreements uh, with places, and there are a lot more internet exchange points or internet peering points. So uh, rather than 30 minutes, it would probably take about two and a half to three hours to do now, and this, this is all the actual engagement. There's still a fair amount of setup to get your stuff in place as there was before, so, but so, that's what that was. So does the fact that it hasn't happened, does that mean that, that hackers have become beneficent over time, or, or why, why, why haven't we seen one of these, these you know, I guess total outages you of the internet? You can't conduct a cyber campaign and go after a target if you've taken out your means of the campaign. <laughs> All right. Anybody Somebody's else? been spending too much time with defense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the trend we're seeing overall is as soon as things move from, you know, vanity and bragging rights to criminal activity, um, which is we're seeing with a trend with malicious code over time, um, we're seeing um, wide scale destruction um, go against the aims and, of the people that have the capabilities to you know, cause harm on the internet. They don't want wide scale destruction, they want targeted attacks, even if those targeted attacks are you know, 50,000 CEOs or 50,000 machine, uh, machines, it's still under the radar. It isn't something where the whole internet jumps up and says, oh my god, we gotta solve this problem, which is what happened with things like Code Red. Um, it's under the radar, no one's really noticing it, and it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a problem. It's something that, um, you know, I don't think we have the, uh, the means to deal with these uh, under the radar types of attacks that are going on. Do you want to make the analogy that Dan did in his speech about the symbiotic relationship? That no. Things yeah, that's well, that's, <laughs> a, that's, another, that's another point. And I think Dan was, uh, you know, Dan took something that uh, Mudge said probably, I don't know, five or six years ago that he noticed um, on machines that were compromised that they were the best managed machines in the network. They were up to patch level, they were hardened. Um, Their log know, files weren't filling up and choking the system. Extraneous, uh, <laughs> extraneous processes that weren't being used for any purpose were removed. Up, yep. so, and, uh, so Dan made this analogy from the medical analogy from going from, you know, um, basically, uh, you know, virus to parasite, which a parasite wants to have the host live, to symbiotic where the symbiote actually wants the host to get better. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that's a great analogy on the machine level, but we're seeing that on the internet level with things like, you know, like the storm bots and things like that. It doesn't want to harm the, your productivity. It wants, it wants your network to run well. So maybe we'll have you know, the storm bots actually making uh, the pipes run better. Who knows? <laughs> well, an, an, another thing that, that we're seeing is we don't, we're having attacks that are coming out that are able to actually target geographic areas. When we saw the, the distributed denial of service attack against the major root name servers that provided .org and .mil, and it only took them out in particular geographic areas, this is because they've started using something called Anycast uh, for uh, responses for DNS requests. So within a particular area, you're always going to, you think the same IP address, but that's a locally pushed out responder to you. So now, if, I mean, if you could do this with BGP, which you can, you can take off particular autonomous systems, you can take off particular organizational uh, areas, uh, but even in the, the distributed denial of service with some of the defensive mechanisms they've put in, you're able to say, I want to take this particular region off the net and keep them off the net, and that still enables me to use the rest of the net's resources or the components that I want. This is a much more devastating attack. So, so are we safer or not as safe as we were 10 years ago when you guys were in front of Congress talking? Uh, well, talking we're more mail. dependent and the security hasn't, hasn't improved much, so I guess that by definition means we're less safe. Anybody else have a I think there? I think education has improved about security vulnerabilities significantly. Um, uh, the fact that a lot of the attacks um, are becoming automated has scared the pants off of people enough that I think that we realize that the defenses have to become automated too, otherwise we'll never keep up. Yeah, but your, your so. education level varies depending on your audience. Yeah, I mean, clearly. your audience is probably, your education people. level is probably pretty high. Well, my I, audience, my education, they need to be there's, one, there's the people who consume code and people who write it. Um, you know, if you don't write bugs as much, then there's less problems to exploit. You know, this may be just a simple linear factor. There may be always configuration issues. Um, you know, there's always a human element, and we do have to find ways of dealing with that. And, and, and to harken back to Dan Gear's speech again, you know, some of these problems may not get solved until control 
is wrested from the user of the machine um, and placed in the hands of somebody who actually knows what they're doing. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you know, people should not be allowed to use their computers or that somebody should be controlling it or monitoring it, but that security and, you know, uh, it may, may become dependent on a certain amount of um, centralization in terms of management of, you know, the things that are vulnerable. That's, it's a thought. I also think that uh, to some degree we are a lot better. I mean, if you look back, I mean, back in 98, not many companies had security contacts and whatnot. They had no internal process and procedures around receiving vulnerability information. And I think that's really changed from an operational standpoint. I think uh, companies, I, I mean, some companies may be better off than others, but uh, for those that are controlling some critical assets or have uh, some very valuable information and whatnot, they have a lot of the process and procedures in place to actually handle the incidents. Because, I mean, it's, there's always going to be zero days out there. There are always going to be vulnerabilities and exploits and whatnot. But you really need to have the strong process and procedures on the back end to know what to do and how to correctly handle that situation. And I think that if you, uh, I think there's a huge uh, increase um, and a maturity around that over the last 10 years. I mean, I, I think that there's still more work that needs to be done, but I think that we're better off from 98. Except for the utility sectors, because SCADA and DCS is just an abomination. Not SCADA. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's funny. I mean, there's, it's been making the news uh, recently, and this was something that The Loft had an article that was in the New York Times around the time that we had, uh, were, had testified to the Senate that we could shut the Internet down in 30 minutes. And I said, I can get into the, you know, the plant control and plant information networks of 30 uh, utility grids that actually have nuclear generators on them. Yeah, like core uh, goes up, core goes no, down. Nobody cares. Core goes up. You know, and so now, now we're, you know, it's finally coming up there. But we've moved from these dedicated systems to Microsoft boxes talking Modbus and World FIPS uh, on, their, on their serial networks. And the stacks alone won't hand, uh, uh, for these systems won't stand up to like an NMAP scan. But we're spending billions of dollars and maybe tens of billions of dollars in, in certainly the, the corporate community, uh, corporate world, on, on security uh, you know, methodologies, on products, on, you know, consultants, uh, you know. Uh, and you're, you're kind of saying, it sounds like you're kind of saying that at least in some sectors of the economy, it, it's irrelevant or it, it hasn't, hasn't made a bit of difference. Yeah, out of sight, out of mind. Anybody else? Want to well, you look at the, the banking industry, right? And um, I, I see a lot of things that in bef before I was with Loft, um, the banking industry was in one state. And I think definitely the maturity has, has risen and that you don't have to prove that a buffer overflow is a dangerous yeah. thing anymore. Good point. Now, that, now it's more like quality assurance. It's, it's like you have to go and clean everything up. We just want a laundry list of everything that's out there and we believe it. So the maturity has definitely gone up, but then uh, by the same token, now um, they want to push out new stuff like mobile banking. So you've got all these new territories that are just as bad as the old one used to be, and maybe they've cleaned up a little bit on the back end in, mm. in the case of finance. For instance, but yeah. So, so at least in some places, the money's, the money's paying off. Na NASDAQ's backup is area, still... Then, but they'll grow a new area that they... Yeah. That it's just weak. But, but they're still missing certain things, like NASDAQ uh, in New York, their backup site is within 15 miles. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, which yeah. is just ridiculous if you're talking about a natural catastrophe or a targeted, you know, hit. So we got vulnerabilities all over the place, even now, but you guys, you know, spent really almost a full decade during the 90s trying to address these, you know, call attention to vulnerabilities, things like that. I mean, you know, are, 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 did, it, did, it, did the way that you go about it did, it, did it help? Is it, you know, can you, can you look at the sort of the, the full disclosure wars and sort of say, yeah, that, that worked, or maybe we should have gone in a different direction? Well, it created an industry that really wasn't there before, um, if, if nothing else, than the selling of exploits to certain organizations. But I think, and Marcus Raynham will always argue the opposite, and this was in something <laughs> recently, uh, that we did make a big difference. Uh, uh, if you look at Microsoft and their response, we helped them out tremendously by rattling their cage, kicking the hornet's nest, as it were. Uh, Intel, as uh, uh, Silicosis was just mentioning, uh, they didn't have a security responder until uh, we came up with their crypto box, the, the vulnerabilities in that. People started realizing that if they weren't going to be responsive to the um, uh, to problems that we were bringing up, you know, we'd take it public and we'd drag them through the muck. And you know, large organizations that are you know, dependent upon their share values didn't want this to happen. Uh, that changed pretty quickly as people realized because we got a lot of notoriety and, and publicity off of a lot of the vulnerabilities that I and others. Uh, published, but and I think a lot of other people who got into the field did it for self-serving, you know, trying to boost their own reputation, their ego. Ours was really, look, these vendors are not listening. The only thing we can do is publicly flog them until they respond. 
And that now, the, now the vendors do respond, and people are still trying to publicly flog them. It's like, no, 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 we have to you know, step up to the next level to try and help elevate. I, have yeah, a I think some people kind of misunderstood like, you know, the goal of vulnerability research. It's not like we're going to find all the vulnerabilities in the product and tell the vendor. It's just like we're going to point out the most egregious ones, and the vendor's going to have to then go in and change the way they build software. So, you know, it's, you can't have an external QA process. You actually have to build the software the correct way. And all we were doing is pointing out that they, that they weren't doing it. You know, vulnerability research itself isn't the solution. The vendors had to respond. And, you know, the vendors that have, you know, do have uh, substantially better code. Yeah. But, you know, ever, the way I look at it is people only start writing better code once they get picked on. And they start getting picked on once they get enough market share. So all the things with small market share, no one is, no one is picking on it. All that stuff is actually very, very fragile and has a lot of vulnerabilities in it. As it starts to get market share, it gets picked on, and then, um, then they say, hey, wait a minute. So there's like a long cycle when a, a company comes to market. There'll be like three or four years of, re of revisions as they grow, and all of a sudden they get picked on, and then they start writing secure code. So because of the way the market is like that, you know, and half the software is written by companies that are probably you know, a few hundred employees, um, we have a lot of vulnerabilities still out there, even with Microsoft and Oracle and Apple doing a good job. So, so, one so of, I, I want to add one thing in there that, that I agree with what Weld said. One thing that's still disturbing is that when people point out a particular vulnerability, let's say it's a buffer overflow, let's just say it's a stack overflow in a particular line of code, that the vendors oftentimes, not always, but still oftentimes, will just go and fix that one particular problem. And what you're really trying to point out is you are making this particular type of mistake. You need to go back and fix all of those areas, and instead they just say, oh, this is what you found, we will fix that, rather than learning from it and actually saying, oh, any place where we have an unbounded copy, we should bound this copy to prevent overflows. And that, that's a, disturbing. This is a big cost, though, to go in through a product, you know, to something as large as you know, a Microsoft operating sure. system or an Oracle application, and, and finding everything that's in there. I mean, that's, sure, it's, that's a big not cost for, it's a big cost for that company. And I'll, and I'll argue that it's a bigger cost for the person who gets popped by it if it's a real targeted, nasty attack. All right. So, so is there, you know, in, well, in speaking, I'm going to go back to you were talking about smaller companies and the fact there's still a lot of vulnerabilities out there. We saw several bug a day kind of episodes, uh, sort of like you know, pick your month, we'll have a different thing, and you know, Apple got picked on, a couple other companies got picked on. You know, was, is there still really a role for that? Did that? Is that the kind of thing that, you, that, that needs to happen for those companies as well? Or, as some people said at the time, was it really just kind of grandstanding on the part of the people who were doing it? Well, I think that the bug a day, is a little bit of it is, is trying to um, you know, focus your energy in one time, and it's, it's a little bit of a marketing spin. Um, I, I think I'm not sure that they really make any more of a difference to do that. I mean, it probably gets it in the press more, which gets their customers to know about it a little bit more. Um, but uh, I, I haven't seen anyone who's been hit with a bug a, bug a, month, bug a day for a month actually change that much. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But, but it took a long time for Microsoft to change. I mean, you guys were, were you and others time. pounded on them for a long time before yeah, they think, finally um, said, we're going to spend a billion dollars and fix this. My, my, Bill, my, when did you first um, the towel you know, of Windows overflows? send the, the IE overflow to, to, the first IE overflow was when? Yeah, the I, Internet Explorer 4.0 had a overflow that I did a while back, was uh, the res overflow. I did a stack one, and I did a heap one with the MK overflow. They, those, those two came out within like a month or so of each other, and it was like 1997. And then Bill Gates came out with his memo in 2002. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it took a lot of stuff to build up to get to the point where they would actually make the investment. Well, you also remember what their first response was when you know, I, I took some of uh, Hobbit's work uh, on uh, what eventually became part of uh, Loftcrack. And their first response was to try and take us out to dinner and then offer us their source code under non-disclosure agreements, which would then stop us from being able to publish any more vulnerabilities that we found. <laughs> We told them we already had it. <laughs> <laughs> How was the dinner? That was, yeah, <laughs> that was good. So, so kind of segueing from that, though, there, there, there was the, the motive issue. There was a lot of controversy from certain people who were really looking to get paid for finding vulnerabilities. What, what's your take on, on whether, you know, is that, is, that, is that valid? Should people be paid for finding vulnerabilities? Well, there's a few ways of looking at that. I mean, clearly, you've got the standard consulting model where people are paid to find vulnerabilities for a particular company and not tell anyone uh, except that company. But then you've got the, the markets that have grown up around vulnerabilities, and you know some of them are more legitimate than others. Um, but 
you know, the thing that I've noticed, I guess, is that, you know, there's a price now for a particular vulnerability or its type. And, you know, back in the day, you know, you were just kind of finding vulnerabilities and it was sort of in a, of infinitesimal or infinite value, depending on the way you looked at it. Uh, nowadays, you know, a particular overflow on a particular platform is, you know, seventy thousand dollars, and that's the, that the, that generally would suggest that someone else is making a making a penny too somewhere off those vulnerabilities. So I'm, I have to ask the question: You know, does you know a vulnerability sharing market result in crime or not? It's a, well, as, as we were mentioning when we talked right before the panel, <coughs> people should be paid for their research. Um, and it, this is cognitive dissonance for me because I'm of, I'm of the mindset that you should be sharing all the nasty, um, dangerous details of it, even if there's not a fix. Because if people are at least aware of it, they can potentially mitigate the effectiveness of the attack, even if there's not a well, defense against that particular attack, by moving resources, changing networking, network ACLs, et cetera. Uh, and I'm saying this, of course, and my biggest clients are, are the intelligence community and the DOD now. So I'm in a bit of a quandary because Do I they don't, share all the vulnerabilities they know? I, I, don't sh I don't share shit anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's, that's an interesting tact. I mean, the reason they don't share a lot of the stuff is a lot of the stuff's offensive in nature, and a lot of the stuff is, is defensive as well, and you don't want other people to, to, to know about uh, the total capabilities that you have, and when you see the commercial sector go the same way, well, you've got to kind of think that there's some of this evil scariness going on in the commercial sector that we've always been thinking about that the feds do. And that's, that's a disturbing trend. Nodding of heads. Well, since we're talking money, I feel like I have to ask you guys, was it worth it to sell out? <laughs> I don't think we had a choice, really. Uh, <laughs> at, at stake, cost me, uh, cost me $75,000 personally. Yeah, I, it I, wasn't free. It, <laughs> yeah, was, not free, it no. was not worth it. I, I think that um, you have to you know, look at what was going on at the time. We weren't in a vacuum. This industry was becoming a professional industry. Uh, people were getting paid to, to do this kind of research and uh, it was becoming um, security, re the whole idea of security research um, was, was becoming commercialized, uh, whether we liked it or not. So, um, you know, it was either do, do we want to stay outside that or do we want to contribute to it and try to make it as, as good as we can? And try and lead it and help evolve or die. Right. You know? Exactly. exactly. The, the, point, I, the point that LOF was at that point prior to, the, to At Stake, I mean, we would have continued on if we had met, continued doing our same thing in the same way, but we would have eventually just died out. Uh, the LOF as it was, I don't think was a sustainable model for any length of time beyond At Stake. Yeah. If we hadn't, tried to do something big. I mean, we made the effort, we're like, this is our shot, we're gonna change the world, make a dent in the universe. Uh, it didn't, unfortunately, work out that way, but that was the goal when it started. Um, and so, was it worth it to sell out? I think we had to give it a shot. Yeah. Well, then, well, had a, well had a great analogy a long time ago, saying like, you know, you can be the best, you know, um, garage band in the world, and the only people that are inspired or hear your message are the people that live in, you know, a couple block radius of you. And you have an option of, you know, trying to you know, change the world and influence people and hopefully do good by staying as that garage band, or you can try and make some educated and, you know, and careful compromises, get a promoter and you know, go to the big venues and try and you know, spread. Maybe your message will be a little diluted, but at least it's still your message and you're hitting more people. And I, that gave me a lot of um, solace and, and hope you know, that we tried to do that. I think we did change the industry in certain ways. I mean, for the first year and a half of that stake, um, we were the only ones that really were not beholden to any vendors. We wouldn't take kickbacks for recommending anybody's stuff. We paid for our own equipment that we were going to do analysis on because we wanted to follow the consumer reports model where people could actually trust what we're doing. When the bubble started to burst and people were kicking out consulting agencies, the big five at the time, were getting booted out and they were keeping at stake because at stake was like, well, they're only thinking about our particular problem. But even then, you know, the executive team and, and the market uh, influences, eventually those morals, uh, or those directions, I should say, started to erode. Um, but it was, it was an effort. Yeah, I mean, 
at the time we were a small software shop. I mean, we had law crack. We Making money with, in spite of ourselves. No, yeah, exactly. Uh, I think if we had more business acumen, we probably would have raised the price of law crack. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what, fifty bucks or something. Yeah, yeah. fifty bucks. I think Semantic was selling it for fifteen hundred. But the <laughs> like version was know. free. I mean, we yeah. Again, the, the open source model in charge for support. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we. Uh, I mean, we were a small product shop. We did also had consulting as well. I mean, we were doing some very cool projects with Network Flight Recorder and whatnot. Yep. But I mean, we were cobbling together systems out of garbage and whatnot, and just trying to build, I mean, like I remember sitting at a desk with, like the desk came out of the garbage, so did the chair. It would just, we're all cobbled <laughs> together working in a room that had no AC and 100 degree heat. But uh, we, needed, uh, we needed to go to the next level so we can continue the great research that we were doing. And, and, and we saw that that next level was, was available, was, was attainable. I mean, it's funny that we did a lot of this technology reclamation. I think somebody at, at the loft coined that might have been well. Dumpster diving. Yeah, dumpster diving, technology reclamation. <laughs> um, and uh, at one point, I, I, was, I was doing some work. I was running training cl classes at the NSA and, and some other things. And word got around to the National Security Council and the executive office of the president. So I convinced the other loft guys that we should allow these feds to come over to our secret establishment as a sign of goodwill so they can see that we're not a risk, you know, and we're not a threat to them. Hopefully we'll actually even be able to call in a favor if, you know, other agencies like the FBI hated us, um, you know, got, got riled up and didn't, didn't know how to take us. And so we give, we give them a tour and, and Richard Clark was there at the time. This is like, what, 97, six, something like yeah. this around there. And they walked outside and they all kind of like grouped together and started talking in huddled whispers. And we're watching them go and we're like, what the hell's going on? What are, what are they whispering about? They could have gone back to a skiff. They could have gone back to D.C., talked about this. So, you know, having enough uh, Irish courage in me at the end of that evening, I said, oh, I'm going to put an end to this. So I just go tromping over in the middle of the discussion and say, we invited you into our house. We opened up the kimono and showed you everything that we were doing. And now you're, you know, you're whispering and you're making us all nervous. You have to tell me what you were just talking about. And they all kind of stepped back and they looked at, at Dick Clark and until that point, I don't think we had realized that he was kind of the head honcho. Uh, and uh, he said, all right, uh, I'll tell you what, what we're thinking about. The CIA and other folks have been giving us briefings saying that the, what you've shown us and what you've accomplished is only doable by funding from a foreign nation state. Uh, and <laughs> and you've, you've, changed our, you've changed our threat model. And this is great. I mean, this is, it's scary, but you've really changed what we have to think about as far as, so this was wonderful things. Of course, he followed up with the, so I have to ask if any foreign nation states approached you <laughs> and, uh, you know, and offered, offered to pay for your services. And I said, no, but if you'd like to be the first, we're willing to entertain it. <laughs> but we had that nice uh, Russian radio company yeah, oh, that oh, yeah. showed up right next door. Yeah, right yeah the Russian mafia right above us. Right with next all their door to the loft, there was a, a a, a Russian radio station next door that had a satellite uplink. We were always kind of like, what the, hell are, they, what the yeah. hell are they doing in there? Yes. Yeah. Never saw anyone ever go in or out. No, no. So, so, so I was curious whether, whether you think that the, the, the model that you tried to do with at stake, could it work now that we're you know, not in that kind of recess, recession era, really in the technology market, a depression almost? If you start a company, try not to tie revenue to headcount. Okay. Try not what? Try not, try not to tie revenue to headcount. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I, I don't think so. I think the thing that was accomplished, well, the thing that I take most pride of for, for at stake, which you know, there's a lot of it I'm not uh, fond of, not happy memories, was that we did influence the consulting field at the time. And we did kind of introduce the, the kind of McKinsey, Bain, high-end um, technical research. And I think that other companies like uh, Frank Heights organization, Leviathan, with Matt Miller, you know, Scape uh, from the Metasploit uh, project and everything, are able to do now because of that foray that we, that we went into. Can you do it again? No, because uh, the industry has already changed that, that opening and that influence that we had. There's other areas to be influenced now. So, so um, some of you have taken the further selling out step of getting married. <laughs> <laughs> how, how has that affected your, your hacking life? Not at all. <laughs> what, 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 was, what was the line? No longer client number eight? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. no. Sorry, honey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that could be a chilly evening for uh, you. That's why we have this conference right now. I'm married to the director of it. So. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, I'm now, uh, when I first got, started doing the law stuff, I was uh, single at the time. Now I'm married and I have two kids. So, you know, I just change, uh, I change focus now. And now I'm looking at my two sons. And it's a lot of... We play a lot of games and exercises and whatnot, just trying to um, inspire creative thinking and just creative problem solving. 
just to uh, just to get them to think different and just come up with different approaches and whatnot, solving problems. It's not always a linear path to get from point A to B. And just trying to encourage that at a young age, I think that's, uh, in my mind, I think that's the future. Your so, kids are really lucky to have you as a father. <laughs> yeah. so, so, and being a dad has been good for your hacking, it sounds like. Yeah, and actually, yeah, my uh, youngest son is actually a perfectly, uh, perfectly good fuzzer who's actually found uh, some problems just by mashing <laughs> the keyboard. <laughs> so, uh, it's interesting. We found some interesting Mac problems. Yeah. Well, well, has this been your experience? Well, um, I, I think I was the only guy who was married when I joined the loft. I'm um, the, oh, right. the oldest, uh, the oldest of the group. Um, well, wasn't, wasn't Count Zero well, uh, and Brian, Brian, Brian Oblivion, Oblivion oh, got yeah. married while he, while he was at the loft? Yeah, Brian, Brian, Brian yes. Oblivion's wife who kicked you guys out? You don't have kids. Um, well, actually, uh, Brian, the, way, the way that we started with our space was actually Brian Oblivion's um, wife who kicked him out of... Um, she didn't, as soon as, he, he, he would do a lot of techni technology reclamation. And so he would be bringing, you know, monitors and PCs and network cabling into the house constantly. And then when he started to stack it up in the bathtub, well, he had to, she, he had that, was, that was the limit. The she said, sink. you really have to get this he stuff his, out He ran here. his BBS out of the kitchen cabinet. Yeah. 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 So that's yeah. actually how we started was um, Brian Ob Oblivion's wife um, had a small loft space in the south end of Boston where she made um, hats. She was a hat maker. And, um, and she, you know, had the hat business wasn't doing so well. She said, you know what, I can rent half my space to these guys. They can, you know, I can get my husband to take all his stuff out of the, out of, out of the house. And that's really how how it how it started. Yep. But I, mean, I I was I just got married uh, this last August, um, first time, only time. Uh, I never intended to get married, and I met a um, brilliant and beautiful mathematician, uh, who so now actually will do my math for me. Um, <laughs> so it, it's it's been great. Now I can actually you know I say, honey, you know this is what I'm doing. You know, is there a, a neat math mathy way that you can represent this in an algorithm and. So you know, the work just looks that much more professional. <laughs> and, and, and actually, you didn't get to finish. Did you? Oh, did, did, did it help your, uh, your your hacking life to have a to have a spouse? Um, yeah. I'm not sure if it <laughs> ever really helps. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I, I think she was, uh, you know, she 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 was definitely motivated me to make the at stake transition. She's like, you know, you love doing this. Why don't you do this as your full time job? You know, and make a make a run at it. So. I remember picking you up when we were going over to Battery. And you're like, do I wear a suit? And both your wife and I were like, when we're asking somebody for $10 million, you put a fucking suit on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was like, I like this guy. <laughs> so the, the, the uh, other thing that we, we, we sort of talked about talking about was uh, the idea of you know, security vendors and are they selling snake oil? Um, and you know, what, do, what do you think? I mean, is, is the AV market really, you know, not very effective, and intrusion detection, all of those kind of areas and sectors within security. Uh, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of hype and a lot of confusion. And, As someone and that works for a security vendor. Um, <coughs> Start, started one. Started one. Um, selling out again. Selling out again. <laughs> <laughs> this time with feeling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think, I think it all has so many promises you make. Um, you know, if you are honest about what you're delivering, if you're you know, product is transparent such that, you know, you, you know, people pay a, an honest amount for a good day's work, regardless of how you generate that, you know, be it by manpower or through automation or through clever algorithms or whatever your process is. You know, if the perception um, by your, you know, by a team of intelligent people who writes code, then your, your customers or whatever, uh, if, uh, you know, if, if they're deriving benefit, then you have a business. And you know, I think the snake oil products, um, we're making a lot of promises in the past. You know, we've had a, a lot of uh, things you know, that, you know, the, the, the story that gets me is the, is the anti-spyware products that install the spyware on your systems. You know, there's, there's a certain level of, of unauthenticness that I think we are getting better at identifying now as a group. And uh, you know, the, the real needs for the, real, for the tools that are out there, you know, are the, you know, are starting to bubble to the to the surface. That's the good stuff. You know, the bad stuff. Uh, throw it out with the bath. You know, just, you know, flush it down the drain. You know, we get a lot of products don't last if they if they build up a bad reputation. And that's just the way it is. 
Uh, that's a good point. I mean, I think just you commented on AV and working for Symantec. So I should uh, respond to that. Um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate right now. I mean, there's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, viruses out there and whatnot. And so someone will always say, well, you know, it's not going to detect everything. And you're absolutely right. There's always going to be these new viruses that don't have signatures written and whatnot. But the thing is, you'll catch 99.99% of the other ones out there. And so, I mean, I've been at client sites and whatnot, and we found a, a compromised system. And it's like, well, we've actually found, like, one of the root trojans of the binaries and whatnot. We were able to kick it back to the internal research lab where they completely reverse engineered it, reverse engineered it dissected it, came out with a new signature that we, we immediately flushed out. And so out of like 25,000 systems, we knew exactly how many systems were infected with it and we could just target those and clean them up. So I mean, yeah, I, I think that there is some value in uh, antivirus software to that degree. I mean, will it prevent everything, or prevent uh, attacks uh, against every uh, uh, thing out there? No, absolutely not, but it does a good job at what it does. And so uh, I think you just need to invest uh, time and have those operational procedures and whatnot to be able to properly respond to those, uh, those pointed attacks where there is no signature or it's, it's a new style attack that nobody has seen before. Well, I, there's, I, go ahead. I, I go ahead. think the problem is, is the marketing, not the technical side. I think when you talk to the technical people at companies that have these products, they're, they're pretty honest about what their capabilities are. But what the communication to the consumer is, uh, I think McAfee's is called uh, total protection. Um, you know, it's like, no, there is no total protection. You know, you have to be honest with your customer that there is always going to be some risk. Um, and you have to be honest about, uh, and I think the, the whole industry has to start to um, say, you know, what percentage of, you know, attacks can they protect against? And exactly, you know, in the grand scheme of things, what, what they're delivering. Because unless you know what it's missing, how as a customer can you try to mitigate what it's, what it's missing? And so it's really, um, you know, all technology has limitations, and, you know, the, I think the marketing just has to be a little more honest. Well, do, I've, do you I've think got an issue. I, I, I want to chime in here on a second. Um, yeah, I agree with what's being said there, but one of the things that nobody seems to be pointing out is what sort of vulnerabilities are these solutions introducing to the systems themselves? I don't know. I can't tell you how many systems that I've broken into that I've used the port and the, and the, and the application that is the antivirus listening for its updates in order to compromise the system. So, yes, they're protecting against certain things, but these people protecting against other vulnerabilities in code oftentimes aren't looking at the security of their own code themselves. And this is... Uh, yeah, well, I, I actually um, uh, went to a talk by um, Sinan um, from Immunity earlier, and he went through about how um, Immunity uh, penetrated a very, very secure organization. They did a, a long-term analysis of how are they going to try to get in before they got in, and they determined that the, the weakest point in the whole organization was the antivirus mail gateway. That was, that, was, that was the weak point. That was the point that you used to get in. They decided that that was what they were going to attack, and they attacked it, and guess what? They got in. And it, it's not just the antivirus stuff. Unfortunately, there was a trend for a while of doing these roll-ups of all these kind of disparate security solutions and then trying to loosely bundle them together with some really bad glue, uh, glue logic and duct tape. And now you have all these extra moving parts and extra inflection points that, uh, as a complex system, com complexity in the security field, you know, that's an anathema concept. You don't even have to worry about the complex systems. I mean, there's a recent case in point where there's a bunch of USB drives that were recently shipped uh, that used the RFID chip and security and encryption. And this was, you know, plastered all over the package. And secure, <laughs> encryption, you know, trigger data with us. Um, kind of find out the encryption was really only used for the RFID chip. The data itself was a simple XOR. So, it, th and those sorts of things are on the market right now. Mm -hmm. so the end user consumer has really no way of knowing, has no way to believe that packaging. And there's no rules or regulations to control it. Well, and, and, and actually, I wanted, I wanted to actually, as our two IT people on the panel, are our two sort of people working in companies who are, are being sold snake oil all the time, you know, <laughs> TAN and, and, and SR, can you talk a bit about whether, maybe, whether there is more realism in what companies are presenting to you, at least in, in corporate environments, uh, and, oh. and, you know, also what it's like to look at this so, whole sort of security uh, industry from that perspective of the people who are, are in fact trying to stay secure. Sure. Uh, I think like today what I'm seeing, at least from financial industry in terms of snake oil, is one of the things that the, being forced on the banks uh, regulation-wise is uh, multi-factor authentication. The idea there is something you have and something you know, uh, like a secure ID type solution, right? And uh, 
Jeez. What, what they've been doing is uh, these companies have been coming up with uh, software-only multi-factor authentication, which basically means there's a JavaScript that goes and looks at, you know, profiles your computer, and that's the thing you have is this profile that's, you know, just generated through JavaScript, the same stuff you can <clears throat> call when you're exploiting them via cross-site scripting or, or whatever. So. Um, to me seemed really weird and the reason is because there's a whole industry around this you know regulation to satisfy this need and as long as people can just view it as like a checkbox or whatever they're going to look for they're going to look for snake oil something that's cheap something that won't break um, uh, their operations because it's not really doing anything so. and, and the auditors require that little checkbox still oh yeah and mm -hmm. and for some reason they have accepted it to date so that's that to me is where the the snake oil is today i think that i've seen how do you explain that to sort of, you know, the, your management, people who aren't technical who are just saying, well, we got to, we got to, this don't, is a problem, we got to solve it. Don't implement your own crypto, period. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we, we've demonstrated its weaknesses, and it's um, like, like the group that I work for, our, our job is to identify the risk, so it's up to the, the managers to make the decisions on how to manage that. But um, um, quite often it's just, you know, the bottom line, it's, it's, it's too expensive, they all feel, to go toward a real multi-factor authentication which is kind of surprising to me, but yeah, even in your world, because that's a world. Yeah, I mean, reputation for spending. Amex in uh, 2000 had the blue card with the smart chip right on it. So I mean, it's the form factor is there to slip it into your existing ATM card and and use the ATM card maybe from home through some smart card reader or something. But instead, they've they're going to settle for JavaScript. So. Wouldn't it be nice if they had to do, do differential power analysis to get the secrets off rather than just, you know, <laughs> popping some cross-site scripting on some sort of message board? Yeah, that would be nice. So, and that's how you're in a smaller company. So yeah, you, I'm you're in a smaller probably... company, and I get people trying to sell me stuff all the time. But uh, the one thing I notice now that it, it's probably different from 10 years ago is that when you read the product literature, you always see the word security. There's usually a paragraph on the back page that says, oh, secure, we use this, uh, this encryption and this many bits, and we do this and that. And it, it's all buzzword stuff. And as a consumer, as an end user, as a purchaser of this equipment stuff, I have no idea what the hell is in it. I mean, yeah, so they're using 256-bit AES. What the hell does that mean? What, it, what part of the product are they using that in? How are they implementing it? Is it really as secure as they're claiming? I have nowhere to go to verify their claims. I, there, there's no rules that they have to say what their stuff is or what it does. Um, so while I think it's, it's, it's more, people are more aware of security now, um, and especially in the marketing departments, uh, I don't think the education level of the people purchasing this stuff is high enough to know exactly what it is they're buying. Well, you're, they you're, no you're, you're saying that, that the vendors are basically putting the new and improved label on right, it, and you exactly. don't know it's new or improved. Exactly. So <laughs> we're, we're almost out of time here. I wanted to ask a question and then open it, to open it up a little bit to the audience. Um, so the last question is, is what makes you scared as hell? <laughs> uh, I'll start. Um, what, what, what scares me is sort of the proliferation of devices that we're now plugging into our general purpose PCs, uh, like picture frames and iPods <laughs> and USB drives that are being made um, in countries like China for basically, you know, the cheaper and faster we can make it, um, the, uh, the, the more I'm going to be able to sell. Um, that doesn't really make a high security device. And we've been seeing that these devices, we came up with this term last night, are coming certified pre-owned. <laughs> <laughs> so they're coming with back doors on them, whether it's by mistake because some employee, you know, brought their laptop into work and sort of infected the manufacturing network, or whether there's actually malicious actors that are using this as a way of owning up a lot of machines and so sort of seeding their bot network. Um, it doesn't actually even matter. Right? There, there needs to be a way that, to detect this situation. That's pretty scary. Tan? Oh, not much keeps me up at night. <laughs> <laughs> He's drink, fearless. I drink pretty heavily and just pass out. So. <laughs> much. Um, current administration and <laughs> having to get onto a panel with the other loft guys after we, we, we did 10 years, <laughs> given all the pain that we went through and put each other through during certain parts of that state. Don't remind us. <laughs> SR, what scares the hell out of you? James Atkinson. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to be anywhere near that guy. <laughs> Paul? Um, I think uh, 
I think uh, some of the trends with uh, virtualization is uh, kind of scary. When you before you'd have uh, 200 physical systems and um, they'd be all running on uh, separate uh, separate segmented networks and whatnot. But you're seeing uh, now clients actually want to take those 200 systems and they want to condense them down onto one or two systems. And so now you have these massive mm -hmm. systems with multiple like terabytes of data or terabytes of memory, terabytes of uh, drive space and whatnot. And it has like maybe 16 network interfaces, but those are virtually mapped across 200 different systems. So just from a security standpoint, it gets very, very interesting. Um, I, I think there's a lot of research that's being uh, performed right now on that, and I think that's going to be the future. As companies are trying to cut back costs and whatnot and move towards these virtual systems, I think uh, it's going to be a new, uh, new paradigm for uh, security and whatnot, a lot of new uh, areas of interesting uh, research and uh, potential attacks. Christian? Um, embedded systems, uh, here, here. things that are getting hooked up to the internet. Um, you know, I, I shuddered when I realized that, you know, uh, after seeing like eight vulnerabilities in libtiff over the last two months, that class three fax is libtiff, okay? You know, you send a fax, it's sending it as tiff, and you know that those low-level drivers are going to be shared all over the place and based on some old tiff reading code. You got multifunction devices that are bridging the fax network, the phone lines with your internal LAN. You know, you got your printer, fax, scanner, multifunction device. Those things are, you know, I, you know, opening up all kinds of, you know, complexity. You know, I, I noticed that my DVD player has its own CPU on it, and that CPU has its, uh, you know, firmware that can be downloaded to it by the BIOS or by any other, you know, thing that happens to get in early enough. Um, you know, Ethernet cards are updatable. You know, just the, the thought of if somebody going through and. Trojaning a whole bunch of Ethernet cards and selling them at the flea market is a little scary. Um, you know, so I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff out there that's now, you know, not burned into ROM but is upgradable, and software that's running in weird little places on CPUs that you know didn't used to, you know, have its own you know memory CPU and bus on itself. So that's that stuff is really interesting. Thanks, guys. Uh, do we have time to have a couple questions from the audience? Is that okay? This is mostly for Tan, though I think uh, Weld will probably want to weigh in, too. Where is the underwriter's laboratory for software, <laughs> and will we see one in our lifetimes? Well, I can answer, but Tan actually wrote the paper in 98 uh, and really came up with the, uh, the original concept because he was looking at the way that other security products pre-software were certified, and with things like uh, uh, safes and... and um, other security devices, you had an independent certification of its capability and a rating, or they couldn't sell it, right? But today, we buy software devices, security products, and we have absolutely no idea whether this stuff really works or not. And, and it wasn't that it was a, a rating of it's safe. It was like the original Underwriters Lab saying it only takes it takes X amount of time before the integrity. Go for it, Dan. Uh, I, I just I just think that uh, it hasn't come about because there hasn't really been a, a credible entity that's jumped on it. Like maybe someone like the post office or someone that's kind of removed from things would be uh, anyone that could be a notary public or something like that could have, you know, run this as a as a program uh, from brand name perspective. Um, so I, I don't know if Vericode is looking at doing at, that. At Vericode, we, we do have uh, ratings that we can we can rate software. It's not sort of our main business is doing ratings, but we can produce one if someone sends us software. Uh, from a vulnerability perspective, not from a does, does it functionally work. There is one organization which does have that brand, which is getting into this, which is Moody's. And Moody's is coming out with operational risk ratings, and they, they will, um, you know, they have a process of certifying your your uh, your organization at the organization level. Um, so I think it'll slowly happen. You know, it's, it almost happens in every industry. It's a normal maturation. There's, there's also um, Alberto Savoya, who uh, is, I think is a co-founder of Agitar, has a side project he calls CRAP. And, and I forget what the <laughs> acronym is, but you can upload your code and, and they'll tell you its crappiness level. Um, <laughs> That's basically Veracode service, but we yeah. call it security <laughs> review. <laughs> <laughs> Super CRAP. Super CRAP. It's like crap, but better. <laughs> oh, only better. Okay, any other questions? I saw some hands out there. Oh, it's down here in the front. Has the knob ever been owned? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's boy. a good story. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys hear the question? Uh, uh, yeah, has, has the, the loft ever been owned? Well, they're fine owned. Yeah. 
There, well, uh, first off, anybody who ever tells you that their systems have never been compromised doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, the best you can really do is say, not to the best of our knowledge, uh, was it ever owned. And one of the things that we used to do is certain people who would terrify me when I was uh, rebuilding the kernel and, and kind of running some of the main systems is I'd actually go and offer root access to certain people who I thought would probably target us and would have a high likely, likelihood of uh, successfully getting in and then once telling them that I was going to give them the root password, that if anything bad happened to the system, I would come after them. Uh, <laughs> this is kind of like Microsoft offering the source code and trying to put you under an NDA. So we, we, we learned from certain things. We did, uh, we did on one April Fool's, own, uh, April, April 1st, we owned, owned ourselves, ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and defaced our own, web, uh, our own web page and got a lot of people calling up and, and laughing. And we did run a bulletin board system uh, as well. And that one was outside of our internal network, did not have any uh, cor um, uh, trust relationships between things. And I'm sure people popped each other's accounts on that, but not the actual loft uh, core the, uh, to, to the best of my knowledge. There, yeah. there were a couple incidences where there was a little, not completely owned, like root access, but there was an incident where uh, one of our uh, shell users, Death um, Veggie, Death veg <laughs> the Death From Vegetable, um, he, we, we required SSH. Um, remotely to get into, but he had an account on an internal box and he SSH into the internal box and then he telnetted from the internal box to lock.com to read his mail and um, someone sniffed his password. Um, yep. Then um, there was an incident where uh, there was a widespread SSH attack going on, and, yep. uh, but uh, we were running loft.com on an, uh, an alpha box, uh -huh. and no one had written shell code for alpha. Uh, by, so we got hit an with that, and it just crashed. An alpha we, box running OpenBSD. <laughs> so you know, using weird architectures on your, on your, on your uh, internet-facing machines is definitely beneficial. And, and, and the, uh, the fact that we actually had a thirty or fifty thousand dollar because they were tough to come by sunscreen that was kind of a prototype one non-addressable interfaces uh, when Sun Microsystems was still putting it together and it was a really cool really well done uh, system that nobody had really seen this was prior to like the whole firewall ones and everything else it's a firewall that components runs completely off of a CD so you have to burn a new copy of the CD every time that you want to change the configuration but it basically you kind of makes it very difficult to and, and it didn't have any addressable interfaces. Yeah, so yeah, there, was no, it was there was no IP address. It was all Ethernet, and it did its own stack translation and all that stuff. It was a bridge. Yeah. A bridge. Yeah. But good question. Okay, any other good questions? Do any of you have a mudge in the dress? No. Oh. Yeah, do, do any of you have any contact info yeah. you'd like to give oh. out for the Internet viewers? or? So, well, we, we, uh, we don't have the L0PHT.com address anymore because it's owned by Symantec. Um, they own a lot of domains. We have loph.t.com, which uh, Space Rogue runs. So, it's which everybody page, used to miss. It's got a picture and some links and an email address. So, if you need to get a hold of anybody, you can send it to the whatever the email address is on the loph.t.com site, and I'll route it to whoever you want it to go to. <coughs> okay. Without any further questions, I want to thank you guys again for being here. All right. Thank you. Further information on Thank you, Michael. Michael. For further Thank information you. on the internet, visit www.mediaarchives.com. Thanks for putting the whole thing on. Thanks, Stacy. Yeah. And also, don't forget, we do have DVDs of all presentations. If anybody's interested, uh, they're right outside the door. Twenty apiece, or uh, ten for a hundred. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're going to put the uh, slides online, check, check the website in a couple weeks. Um, sessions are outside, and thank you for being the founding attendees of Source Boston. <laughs> sure. safe company that uh, protects the crown jewels for the uh, royalty in London there, the uh, John Tan safe company. So that's just a physical security reference. And for the same reason everybody else, you know, has, has done it in the past is uh, just be anonymous online for one thing to protect uh, 
your identity in the same way that just makes common sense. Um, you tell your children to do the same thing, right? So, um, and now I'm in the finance industry again. I spent 10 years before Loft in finance, and uh, after I'd stake, I'm back in, in the finance industry once again, so. You may also take a drink. <laughs> I should have brought out one. I'll drink one more. Sweet. Cheers. Okay. Yeah, okay. I thought we were going to have five minutes. I thought we were supposed to go through with what we've done the past ten years. Um, <laughs> all right, tell me when I can start. Because <laughs> my, my, wife, my wife was uh, nice enough to, so one of the things is I got married. I'm Mudge. Uh, and in the last ten years, let's see, I'm currently... Why don't you pick the name? Huh? I'll get to that at the end there. Uh -huh. If you're interrupting, I get some extra seconds then. <laughs> um, I'm currently the technical director of National Intelligence Research and Applications for BBN, a little company that invented the internet, first silent running uh, torpedoes, lots of stuff like that. I was made a plank owner of one of the current destroyers, along with Madeleine Albright and Richard Clark. Um, I've been giving a lot of talks at universities associated with CyberCore. CyberCore is the President's Scholarship for Service. Uh, this is kind of like a cyber ROTC. Uh, you get uh, your college uh, paid for, and then you have to go do two years or four years working for a national lab, working for the CIA, the NSA, or one of those places. Um, I provide uh, in reports and input to the Intelligence Science Board and the Director of National Intelligence. I was visiting scientists for two, three years at Carnegie Mellon. Um, a couple of IEEE awards. To, uh, oh, I got a, a congratulatory letter from uh, the CIA for contributing to their uh, mission criti critical mission, which they didn't say what that was. Uh, <laughs> I briefed the uh, Democratic Policy Committee, Senator Edwards. I'm currently providing input to one of the presidential candidates that's running right now on critical infrastructure. And da, da, da. I, I was the person who testified against Vonage and shut them down for Verizon as an expert witness. So. That's really working for the devil. Uh, I got you, married. You can All start that fun stuff. Fruit anytime now. Yep. So the name there, I, I give people who say, "Where did Mudge come from?" Three uh, choices for the answer. One is the short one, which is an entire lie. The second. Keep talking. There you go. Hi, I'm Michael Fitzgerald, and I'm a, a journalist who uh, was asked to moderate this panel because I wrote a piece on, on uh, where the loft is now. Uh, it got published last year in CSO Magazine and, and just won an award. You guys Yay! are award winners or something. So, <laughs> thank you. My job is mostly to stay out of your way and, and also to uh, make sure that uh, they don't get boring. Um, so, uh, I have a, lot, a big task ahead of me. Uh, please throw fruit at them when they do start to fall off track. Um, but basically what we're going to do here is we're going we're to talk for an hour about issues that uh, you know, have emerged from, from the days that the law is being formed uh, in the security field, and we'll talk a bit about where they are. And we're going to have them start by, uh, each of them is going to introduce himself. They are going to uh, talk about you know, what their handle was, whether they're still using the handle now, uh, why they picked the handle, whether they're still using it now, uh, and what they're doing today. They have two minutes to introduce themselves. <laughs> they can all take a drink if they succeed in, in keeping it under two minutes, except Mudge, who can only drink if he does not exceed two minutes. <laughs> okay, so take it away, guys. I guess I'll start at the end. Uh, Chris Weishopel, uh also known as Weld Pond, not formally known as, because uh, you know occasionally people are still refer to me that, and you know there's nothing, nothing shady that happened that I'm trying to hide from. Um, the uh, the the uh, the name originally came because um, I was forced to pick a name to enter a BBS in Boston called The Works, and they said we don't allow anyone to use their real name, and I said, oh, this is going to be interesting. So, uh, but then I said I have to pick one. 
and I really wanted to log in, I, and so I didn't spend a lot of time doing it. I just uh, had, a, had a map on my wall, and I pointed at the map, and I pointed to Weld Pond, which is in, uh, I think it's in Braintree, Massachusetts. I've never actually been there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was living in Somerville at the time. And so, uh, you know, it's completely goofy and random, and uh, it just seemed to work, so I stuck with it. And oh, so what am I doing now? Um, uh, I was one of the ones who actually stayed the whole, uh, the whole purgatory of At Stake, I guess. Good times and bad times. Um, lasted the whole time from when Loft was there until the company got sold to Symantec. Um, and then I was at Symantec for another year. And now um, I'm working with uh, Christian Ryu down the end. And we uh, are the co-founders of Vericode. Thanks. You may take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, John Tan. Uh, I picked that na name because of uh, the uh, um